is the Driving Dish Podcast. Oh, me, oh, my. A monster jam. Talking about NBA news, stats, and fantasy. Oh, to start it off, it's Tim Tompkins and Kevin Rafuse. Oh, he just took the gravity right out of the building. Let's go. The day is finally upon us. We have made it. NBA playoffs officially here. Welcome to the Drive and Dish NBA podcast. I guess we'll call this the special playoff edition. My name is Kevin Rafuse. Joined to me on my left is my co-host Tim Tompkins. Hi, to hello everybody. And joined behind the boards, keeping us honest as always, Justin Kuzart. Giggity. Giggity. Uh, <laughs> what, what are you doing? Hmm? What are you doing? What do you mean? Hi, ho what? <laughs> what? What? We did. That's, that's a common way to say hi. Hi, ho in Texas, maybe. Yeah, well, I bet we have listeners in Texas. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> so I was talking about this with my buddy earlier with NBA playoffs being here, like I said. NHL playoffs under swing right now. Baseball is back. Is this the best time of sports the entire year? I think it is because you have so many awesome sports and so much important stuff happening. There's so much excitement happening in sports right now. It's like Christmas. I love the NBA playoffs. I have I'm getting over the sting of the Suns not being in there and everything, and I'm finally finally starting to get into the swing of things. And you know, games are just now starting to come on TV. And you know, I'm reading all these blogs, and we're doing the podcasts, and all the other podcasts I listen to are doing their NBA playoff specials, and it it's just really exciting. And speaking of the podcast, if you're on Twitter right now, you can hashtag DAD Pod. Talk about the games, what you've seen so far, what you like, what you don't like, pitch show ideas, all sorts of other fun stuff. You can follow me on. Twitter at refuse to lose. That's R A F U S C to lose. Tim is at Tim from Tucson. Justin, you actually change your Twitter handle. You are no longer Jay Kuzar. You're actually Radio Justin nine oh four. Well, why the change? Yeah, I just didn't want people knowing my last name. I mean, I guess they could just go back a few episodes and know my last name, but now it's hidden. I was gonna say we intro your last name every show. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> and I think it's still on the uh, outro to this one, but yeah. it's all right. But, we'll, we'll it's fix all right. It. You, you, we'll, we'll pretend you have that privacy though. <laughs> And also new this week, we have a Facebook page. We are officially on Facebook. You just search the Drive and Dish podcast. We'll be there. Give us a like. We post basketball news throughout the week and all sorts of other fun goodies and opinions. And you can subscribe on iTunes as well. Again, search the Drive and Dish NBA podcast. It is free. The best things in life are free, like subscribing for this podcast. So do it. This week on this episode... Pretty self-explanatory. Going to be uh, talking the playoffs. I don't think much else needs to be said. We're going to break down every single series. We're going to give you our playoff predictions. We actually filled out our playoff brackets. Going to talk about the matchups to watch for and all sorts of other fun goodies. But before we do that, why don't we get into some news? Justin, you got the news today? Yes, I do. All right, let's do it. Wait, push it up for the win! Yeah, baby! Now on NBA News on the Drive and Dish Podcast. Memphis Grizzlies backup point guard Nick Calathis is suspended for 20 games due to violating the NBA's anti-drug policy. The suspension will begin immediately and Calathis will miss the playoffs. Calathis averaged 5 points and 3 assists for the Grizzlies during the regular season. LA Lakers point guard Kendall Marshall plans to play for the team in the Summer League in July. The Lakers have reportedly planned to pick up the non-guaranteed season on Marshall's contract for the 2014-2015 season. Marshall has averaged 8 points and 8.8 assists for the Lakers this season. The Los Angeles Lakers have their highest pick in over 30 years, but they may be interested in trading it away. The Lakers are looking to accelerate their rebuilding efforts around Kobe Bryant and their cap space. Brian Shaw praised Kenneth Fareed's play in the second half of the regular season and expects the forward to remain with the Denver Nuggets next season. I definitely want to have him back and expect to have him back, Shaw said. Freed was the Nuggets' best player after the All-Star break, leading the team in scoring with 18.8 points per game, 10.1 rebounds, and a shooting percentage of 54.6%. The New York Knicks announced that they have signed Lamar Odom to a multi-year deal. The remainder of his contract is non-guaranteed. This gives the Knicks the ability to monitor his conditioning and commitment over the summer. Lamar Odom could serve as a mentor to young players if the Knicks try to implement Phil Jackson's triangle offense next season. Thanks so much for reading that news, Justin. So yeah, the New York Knicks, they're signing Lamar Odom to a two-year contract next year being a team option for the Knicks. What kind of impact do you think that he'll have for the team going forward? I mean, I can't. I don't really think the expectations can be too high. He's been kind of a non-factor on some pretty good Clippers teams, so he's had a chance to shine per se. But I do think that if there's anyone that could redeem him, it's Phil Jackson. They've had success in the past on those Lakers teams that won the title. Do you guys think that this signals any sort of uh, move forward with the Knicks possibly running a triangle offense next 
next year. We know that obviously Lamar Odom played under Phil Jackson with the Lakers very successfully, and maybe he can kind of mentor those younger players. I think it depends on, I guess, where they go in the coaching direction. It seems like Mike Woodson's out the door. I believe they said they're going to make a decision on that by next week. There's also been the Steve Kerr rumors are heating up that mm-hmm. he's, I think there was a report out that says he expects a job offer. Yeah, I saw that. He was. He said he expects one soon, actually. So there's a, um, I think there's a very good chance that if he comes in, that maybe he can install that triangle offense. But I don't think I don't think we should just necessarily assume that because Phil Jackson's there. I think you it know, depends on the personnel. Sure, and uh, Lamar Odom, I think, is signaling a triangle offense. So this week on the NBA Drive and Dish podcast, if we haven't told you enough already, make sure we have it. We're official now. We have a new Facebook page, so you can go on Facebook and talk to us. It's facebook.com slash drive and dish podcast. But the first thing we're going to do is we are going to preview the Western Conference first round playoffs. The Western Conference has been better in the east anyway they deserve to go first exactly and so so starting off we have the spurs versus mavericks in the one verse eight seed as we all know the spurs won the season series four and oh mm-hmm. uh during the season series the spurs averaged 115 points and this might be the last time that we get to see a duncan and dirk playoff matchup i hope not honestly i want to see it happen again i would like to see it happen one more time and i, I don't think it's tough to tell what the guys age are <laughs> But it's not like either of them are inefficient at this point. They're both still really great players. I mean, Dirk's just been phenomenal this year. I think maybe, you know, Dirk said he's going to take less money to stick around. I think there's a chance that they're still going and we could see this again. But it would have to be obviously soon within the next year or two. The Spurs really seem to have the Mavs number. They haven't. It's been nine straight wins for the Spurs over the Mavericks. Just totally in their head. Beat them by 10 the other day. Well, personally, I think right now you have Tony Parker versus Jose Calderon. And, you know, this is what happens when an unstoppable force meets a very movable object. (laughs) I mean, this is a terrible, terrible matchup for Jose Calderon I personally I think that Parker could average 30 points in this game I think if he wants to yeah it depends what kind of Tony Parker you get if you get that aggressive attacking Tony Parker who is just a wizard inside the paint I mean I think he definitely could it's certainly a matchup the only factor that Jose Calderon's beating Tony Parker in his free throw shooting you know that's not completely true I, I Calderon actually has been the best spot up shooter in the, in the NBA this season uh, with an effective field goal percentage of 74 percent so hmm. if Parker helps off off of them then that could spell damage for the Spurs see I'm excited to see what uh Kawhi Leonard does because he's honestly one of my favorite players just I don't know why he just is but I'm excited to see how he does because he was kind of last last year in the playoffs I don't remember him having like he did good no he came alive in the playoffs he's one of those players that he's like Jeff Teague where you don't see him all year and then all of a sudden in the playoffs he's just fantastic it's national attention spotlight's finally on him I mean, he's been leading the Spurs in minutes this year. He's been the backbone while other players have been resting, you know, Duncan and Ginobili and Parker getting those crucial minutes off Mm -hmm. going into the playoffs. I think there's no reason why he can't get out there. The Spurs are on a mission. Yeah. That's just what it comes down to. I'm worried to see who Splitter has to guard, though, because it's either probably going to be Dallin Bear, or which wouldn't be too upsetting. But, I mean, if he has to be on Dirk at all, I feel like Dirk's just going to make him look He'll destroy him. He's not going to be able to guard him on the perimeter at all. So who do you guys think takes this season series? I think it's Spurs and four. I think it's a clean sweep. Um, the Spurs just seem to have the Mavericks number as great as Dirk is. And if there's anybody that could steal a game, it'd be Dirk. But I just think the Spurs are on a mission and the way they've just dominated the Mavericks. And you said 115 points they're averaging against them. I just think the Spurs run away with this and make it a quick series so that they can get their players that rest, too. I completely agree. Uh, maybe Dirk pulls one game out of his pocket, but I don't see it being much more than that. All right. So I have Spurs in four as well. So that mm-hmm. seems to be kind of the consensus around the table. Let me ask you guys another question. What is the ceiling for each of these teams moving forward? I mean, the Spurs, you have to think, is is the title contender this year. It's title or bust for them. Mm -hmm. You know, they were very, very close, probably as close as you can get without actually winning a title last year. Like I said, you know, they rattled off that big win streak earlier in the year. They've been, you know, this is their time. This is what they're gearing up for. It's the title for them. There's no other. The Spurs are one of those five contenders that I probably would say that I think have a genuine chance of winning the NBA finals. How about the Mavericks? As for the Mavericks, I mean, maybe a second round team. I think they've overachieved as it is, is to get to this point. You know, they've had some great veteran contributions. Dirk's played 
really well. Rick Carlisle's done a tremendous coaching job. They've gotten contributions from Monta Ellis and Vince Carter, and it's just the most wily cast of characters. And you got to tip your hat for them making the playoffs. They really battled hard this year. They didn't make it last year. Had a lot of injuries to deal with. But I don't have to tip my hat to him. <laughs> He's a little bitter. <laughs> just, just a tad there. But I mean, I think the Mavs have gotten as far as they're going to get. This isn't the team that won the title in 2011. How about you, Justin? I actually agree completely. I could, I could see Dallas challenging either uh, Portland or the Rockets. I could see him challenging them, but I don't see them going past. Okay, and you, and you have the Spurs for their ceiling being Yeah, I think they could go all the way. I actually think they may go all the way this year. All right, so next up we have the two, the two versus seven matchup, which is the Thunder versus Grizzlies. The Thunder took the season series 3-1 to one against the Grizzlies. Right now, Nick Lathis is out for the remainder of the playoffs uh, due to the NBA suspending him for violating their NBA anti-drug policy. Mm-hmm. What do you guys think about this? This is an interesting matchup for me because if we go back to last year, granted, Westbrook was hurt. So we have to take that into account. But the Memphis Grizzlies gave Kevin Durant fits. I don't think we've ever seen a playoff series fluster Kevin Durant the way that series against Memphis did. And I know we said OKC went three and one against <clears throat> Memphis this year. But if there's any team that really you know flusters the thunder, it's having Zach Randolph and Marcus Saul in the paint every time. You know, they're surrounded with shooters. They're surrounded with guys who have playoff experience. Memphis has been there before making the conference finals last year. I think if they're I think this team is going to battle OKC. They, you know, they have been one of the hottest teams team since getting Marcus Saul back Mm -hmm. I think there's no reason to think why they can't really push Oklahoma City in this playoff series so basically you don't think that their backup point guard Nick Clathis being out for the remainder of the postseason is going to have that much of an impact on you know their chances moving forward I mean I don't think it's really that big the guy averages about five points and three assists a game I think that could be easily replaced by whoever they have in there to fill his role it's not really a I don't want to downplay the backup point guard but it's not like he's an elite backup point guard it's not like he's like a Reggie Jackson for the Thunder per se you know I I actually completely disagree with you on this. I think that the backup point guard role is by far one of the most important roles in the NBA. You know, look at the Pacers when C.J. Watson went down. Um, look at the Pacers last year with their struggles having D.J. Augustine being their, their backup point guard. Look at the Phoenix Suns when Eric Bledsoe went down. I mean, it's not just about their stats. It's about how they control an offense when your star point guard comes out of the game and the starters can't play 48 minutes. I mean, that's not even a, a fair role to have to put them into. And apart from that, it just this right here here ruins the consistency and the way that the players felt when they were on the court together because all season long they've been working on those lineups when they were playing with Nick mm-hmm. Lathis and now that he's gone it just completely ruins the chemistry of the team moving forward I what, can see that what about the interior lineups you know you have Zach Randolph a much more physical bully his way kind of guy where you have Serge Ibaka who's a more athletic you know long shot blocker what do you think about that matchup well that's what I was going to mention when you guys were talking about it I think having Randolph and Gasol inside is really really going to piss off Perkins, Ibaka, and Durant. I think all three of them are going to be very frustrated with that because they're going to cause so much attention that I think maybe some outside shots will be there when they normally wouldn't against other teams. And also, you know, if you give them any room, they're going to make you pay for it. I think Memphis, a big addition or an underrated addition for them this year was uh, Mike Miller coming Mm -hmm. off two straight finals wins. You know, he's been a proven veteran shooter come playoff time for them. He's put in some big crunch time minutes despite for Miami when I know last year he wasn't really getting any playoff time or playing time I should say in the regular season and then comes in and just hits a bunch of big shots in the playoffs that's the kind of guy you want on this Memphis team absolutely and coming off the bench you know uh, being dished those assists by Nick Calathis but personally for me I think you know you, you have your point guard matchup right here which I, is, is super interesting and I'm really looking forward to it because you have two completely different and um, both dynamic point guards you have Russell Westbrook versus Mike Conley and as as we all know Russell Westbrook is one of the most explosive point guards in the NBA and basically it's Mike Conley's job to stop him Westbrook puts more pressure on transition defense than any other point guard in the league uh, honestly Mike Conley has struggled shooting against OKC this year he's only averaged 36 percent against OKC and I think that Mike Conley is going to be asked to stay ahead of Westbrook and look for holes when he's running the Memphis offense and Oklahoma City's defense I mean I just think Mike Conley like you said it's got to up that shooting percentage he's such a key part of that offense it's not like the Grizzlies are the most gifted offensive team. They're not exactly a juggernaut that's going to blow
blow you out of the water. They need Conley to contribute. If Conley doesn't contribute, they're not going to stand any chance of beating the Slender team. And how can he contribute when he's constantly having to stay in front of Russell Westbrook? I mean, playing he's both be tired. the floor. Very tired. He's going to be tired running around with Westbrook. That's I think anybody who plays against Westbrook is going to be tired. You're, you're running a lot. Well, I definitely think that the narrative of this series right here is the Thunder getting revenge on the Grizzlies for them with that upset last year. Let me ask you guys, who takes this series? Thunder. I think the Thunder the Thunder are finally going to do it. I think it's I think the Thunder just are way too talented. I don't think the Grizzlies have enough offensive firepower to keep up with them. Kevin Durant's playing MVP basketball. I think the Thunder beat them in six. All right, I got uh, Thunder in five. Five. I mm-hmm. actually have them in six as well. Okay, uh, the ceiling for the Thunder. I think the ceiling for the Thunder, I think they're another title or bust team. Yeah. I don't think there's any way around it. It's been kind of that way since they made the finals two years ago. They're back in pending injury. You know, Westbrook is healthy. Their bench has been better than it's ever been. Kevin Durant's playing the best basketball of his career. It's got to be finals or bust for them. Yeah, I'm thinking the same thing. And then for Memphis, I mean, even if they were to beat OKC in some crazy upset, I don't see them beating the Clippers or Golden State. So I don't see them going test the first round. Yeah, I think there's an unlikely scenario where they could maybe get to the Western Conference Finals like last year. They have playoff experience. They are a really, really good defensive team. But I would lean towards second round being their peak. Um, I actually have the same. You know, so this next matchup that we have is the three versus six. The Clippers versus the Warriors. Now, they split the season series two and two. As we all know, Bogut is out for the playoffs and David Lee is going to play that center spot. What do you guys think about this matchup? This to me is the best matchup of the Western Conference. First off, these two teams genuinely don't like each other. <laughs> We've seen, uh, we saw a talk in the media this week with Clay Thompson accusing Blake Griffin of flopping. There's been some uh, back and forth going there a little bit. Both matchups we've seen this season have been testy. Um, like we said, evenly split. Both have dynamic offenses that can go off at any time. Not really the best defensive teams. Uh, a lot of star power going around with Chris Paul and Steph Curry and Blake Griffin. Just this is going to be a fun series. I'm really excited for this series. Yeah, I, I agree. I am I have a feeling Curry is going to go off in at least one, if not a few games where he just has some crazy stats and just last year they used kind of a, a weird small ball lineup with David Lee being as ineffective as he was this mm-hmm. year it's now reversed with Bogut being hurt. Right, they're being forced into it. And we saw that really excel for a guy like Harrison Barnes, who was a breakout for him last year. And Steph Curry, you know, we saw what he did last year on his incredible run. And I, I know maybe that magic strikes again. Maybe this is, this is what they've been looking for. Draymond Green. I mean, how big is he going to be in this series? Yeah, I think Iguodala is going to be a big help defensively for the Warriors as well. And I wonder if the Warriors are going to end up putting Iguodala on Chris Paul uh, for you know, would, parts of the game. That would be an interesting uh, scenario, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. So right now in the series, you have Chris Paul versus Steph Curry. Uh, personally, I think that Chris Paul needs to prove that the Clippers are the real deal, you know, and they're they're not just a highlight team. There's expectations on the Clippers this year. There's been they've been kind of close in the past, but there's real expectations on the Clippers this year. I don't want to jump the gun and say what's their ceiling, but I'm going to. The Clippers ceiling is that they're a title contender this year. They have to be. I completely agree, actually. I think if there's one dark horse in the West that could come out, it would definitely be the Clippers. They, outside of OKC and the Spurs, the Clippers have the best chance to make it to the finals. And they're healthy. That's the big thing this year. They're getting or they're getting Jamal Crawford back. J.J. Redick, finally, for the first time this season, looks like he's going to be ready to go. Jared Dudley's been playing I, a little bit better. I feel like J.J. Redick and uh, and Crawford are both going to be big, big in these, uh, in these upcoming games. I think they'll help a lot. And Blake Griffin's kind of taking the leap this year. He's mm-hmm. just been, uh, you know, like we said, he's kind of broken out of that highlight only dunking mentality his, his jumper's gotten a lot more respectable you know he's they're improving on defense they're doing some things well but this is going to be we've talked about golden state a lot and if golden state shooters are on they can get themselves into any single game absolutely i think steph curry is going to be asked to shoot a lot especially with the small ball mm-hmm. lineup i kind of expect steph curry to be taking about 15 threes a game you think yeah okay. yeah with them going small they how, don't have an option he needs to score how many do you think he'll make oh with it being steph curry <laughs> 10 this <laughs> okay just go off the 30 <laughs> points on 10 three pointers a game that's fine with me then I'm, I'm okay with that all right so i know we jumped the gun a little bit and we did the uh 
how far the Clippers can go. Uh, what do you guys think is the peak for the Warriors? I'm so the Warriors, I think, are the hardest to pick in the entire playoffs. I think are really because you've seen the Warriors play, especially as they stumble down the stretch. We hit on that a little bit last week. And there were times where it's like the Warriors are looking like a first round exit. And then there's other times where it's like the Warriors could be that dark horse finals contender and go all the way to there. So I'm going to go as far as say is if their shooters are on and they're playing as well as they can and some of those small ball lines click again, I think they could be a dark horse finals team. Wow, that is that is bold. I, I think that their peak is the second round. You think? I, I think they make it. To, uh, they could potentially make it to the third, I think. I don't see them getting past. I, I have the Spurs. I don't see them getting past the Spurs All right, if, so if they I, made it there. I have the Clippers going in six. What about or winning in six? I do too, actually. I have them in six. I have the Clippers in seven. I think Golden State's, you know, it's been such an even matchup, and I think Golden State is going to give the Clippers all they can handle in the first round. But I do think the LA Clippers are a better team. I think they are a real finals contender, not a dark horse finals contender. I think I think this one will be the most exciting to watch. Yeah, definitely. Like I said, I think this, this is the, if I were to pick one series in its entirety just to watch that one only, I think this is the one. Mm -hmm. All right. So moving forward, we have the Rockets versus the Trailblazers. The Rockets won the series three to one. um, And in those wins, the Rockets averaged 120 points. And I, you know, I think that the series is all about can Dwight put his money where his mouth is and redeem himself for last year's playoffs with the Lakers. I mean, for me, I actually think the series is kind of defense optional. I I think that's the highlight (laughs) for the series. Especially with James Harden. I mean, his uh, James Harden defense is absolutely atrocious. And I think that that's going to be completely unbelievable uncovered in this series yeah it's certainly you know both these teams are going to be running both these teams are young and athletic i mean it's gonna it, this could very well be whoever scores 125 points wins the game mm-hmm. one of those series but if we're going to go back to dwight i mean dwight's been playing better this season we've seen him in a, a better mental space than definitely was there in la i think he's more healthy you know i think dwight will have that one game where he kind of goes nuts and puts like a 30 and 10 or 30 and 15 on the board maybe the one the one thing i see in this is i i see dwight howard having his hands full with uh, Aldridge and Lopez I, I think he's going to be uh, pretty frustrated through most of the games because both of them are going to you know they're very very rough players so he's going to take his uh, fair share of hits how much do you think Hacka Dwight's going to come into this you know, do you think the do you think there's going to be a point where the Trailblazers intentionally try to put him on the line if the Rockets seem to be going to him first on offense? Why would why would they stop doing Hack of Dwight now? Yeah, I mean, it's been it's proven effective. Mm-hmm. His free throw shooting certainly hasn't gotten any better. So I think it'll be interesting to see whether they you know employ that as an actual strategy and, and you know how the Rockets are able to counteract that if they choose to go to Dwight as one of their first options. Well, maybe also in the Trailblazers trying to get the switch and end up getting. LaMarcus Aldridge on Dwight and drawing fouls on Dwight and trying to get him out of games early uh, with that as well. That could be an interesting thing to look for. Sure. And so the point guard matchup in this one is Patrick Beverly versus Damian Lillard. My thing is, is obviously we know who's the better point guard in the situation. Absolutely. But Damian Lillard will get frustrated with Beverly's antics. Now, Beverly is a threat when he's off on the right wing shooting, but mostly he's a a slash and drive kind of player. And with Lillard, you know, Lillard, he can't just shoot threes. He has to drive to the basket. But Mm -hmm. if he does, he's going to be dealing with Dwight Howard at the basket. And I wonder how much that's going to affect his almost rookie-ish, you know, NBA game. I I could see it being scary. I mean, no one wants to go and take a lane when you you see Dwight Howard standing there ready to to contest. I right, mean, and you can't just jack up threes in an entire playoff series. I mean, that might be acceptable during the regular season, but during a playoffs, you just can't do that. I just think you, you, the point you brought up about Beverly is his defense. You know, Beverly might be the most annoying player in the league for <laughs> offensive guys, and you know, Lillard's going to have to keep his composure. He's one of the leaders on this team to begin with. They need him to keep that composure, and he needs to not get flustered by Beverly because you know Beverly is going to be trying to annoy him and get him off his game from the opening tip. My other question is, do you think we're going to see any Lin sanity this game, in this series? No. No, you don't think Jeremy Lin's going to have any... Uh, no, no. I mean, he, you know, he can run and pick and roll. He can shoot a little bit. You don't think he, he's not going to not a fan. OK, not a fan. There, <laughs> there's no Jeremy Lin fan in me. Okay. Uh, so what do you guys think that the peak is for these teams? Uh, the Rockets first. I could see the Rockets. Well, I, I, I see the Rockets winning this one. I have them winning. Uh, I have them winning in six, but I don't see them getting past the Spurs. So uh, second round, yeah, you second think is round. Their peak? I don't see them going any farther than that. 
I think the I think realistically, if everything clicks, there's no reason why the Rockets can't win the finals. I think they're in that real contender list. You're I think crazy. they have the firepower. The offense is there. I don't think that, I'm not saying that that's my finals pick, but I'm saying they could, in theory, no. win the finals. No, they couldn't. Yes, they could. <laughs> no, they couldn't because James, James Harden's Harden, the best shooting guard in the league. James, have you ever seen him play defense? He, but no. that offense can go with anybody. You know what the most fun drinking game ever is? Is every time James Harden gets into a defensive stance, you take a drink. That sounds terrible because he doesn't get into it. You don't right. And then you don't have to get a DD. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. But I'm, I mean, even though, but Harden is still, he's, he's still draining 25 points. You know? James yeah, Harden, but he's giving up that many points on the other James end. Harden took over against the Spurs though, in the Western conference finals two years ago, James Harden absolutely was the guy and won that series by himself. Essentially. He was the marquee guy. If James Harden's on, he's the best shooting guard in the league. There's no reason why James Harden can't take a game over. Yeah. Why Chandler Parson can't have one of those. He hits 10, three pointers games. Why Dwight Howard can't have one of those games where he drops 30 and, 15 per se i agree that's they, three they, wins in a series right there sure and and they could make it to the second round that's my peak for him that's i think that their ceiling is a second round trailblazers thoughts uh what's their peak i don't see them winning at all i, I don't see them getting out of this so you think their their peak is a first round exit yes I, I, I believe so i think maybe if their offense clicks they can get to the second round if they beat houston i don't think they're going to beat houston my pick for that series is actually houston and six i think portland's portland's home court advantage is also very underrated they actually have the longest sellout streak in the nba right now really yeah hmm. um even with the you know even with the kind of second half struggles a little bit yeah. they've really rally behind this team um i think lamarcus aldridge is one of those guys that can steal you a game same with lillard um i think their starting lineup has played together a lot this season you know nick batum's played in all 82 games Wes matthews has played in all 82 games but i i think they're a second round team i just don't think they have they don't play a defense well enough and they don't have a good enough bench to really go any further than that. i concur defense does matter <laughs> the defense does matter <laughs> oh, yeah. all right so uh, let's see i have portland winning the series in seven really yep and you guys both took houston yes, uh, both so in six games correct uh, uh yes six I mean, and then seven? yes uh, seven. No, six for me. All right. Well, there you go. Let's see who's right. Um, you know, so far <laughs> I've won all of these battles with um, my fellow co-hosts. Uh, <laughs> all right. Moving on over to the Eastern Conference. Your one versus eight matchup is the Pacers versus the Hawks. They actually split the season series, surprisingly two and two. Yeah. Uh, the Hawks did hit 40 percent against the Pacers from the three point range during the regular season matchups. And, you know, my big takeaway from this was are the Pacers actually contenders or were we fooled by a few good few months of good basketball earlier in the season? I think the Pacers are actually contenders. If we're going to kind of kick it off with that. I think the Pacers mm-hmm. ceiling is they can win the whole thing. I think that the Pacers got off to a lightning fast start and that people were maybe buying into it too much and that they were thinking they were better than they actually are. Um, and we kind of saw them wore down a little bit by the second season, but that starting lineup is as comfortable together as any starting lineup in the league. They're starting five playing the most minutes together. Mm-hmm. It's more than double than any other team in the league. I think people have been more than hitting on their defense. I think we could have talked about that all season. You know, Roy Hibbert is that game changing guy come playoff times in the interior. There's no weakness for that. You know, Paul George could be one of those elite guys. He struggled with his shot, but if he finds a shot again, who's to say that he can't do what he did last year in the playoffs. They have the playoff experience now. It's been three straight years. They've made it. They've made back to back Eastern conference finals. I don't think we were fooled by a few good months of basketball and to top it all off. Atlanta's hurt. We've talked about Atlanta's injuries. Al Horford is not going to be playing, you know, credit to them for even making the playoffs with how many injuries they've had to deal with but i mean they're just simply going to be outclassed here even with the pacer struggles they're outclassed well that's what i was going to say i think hibbert is not going to have much trouble in this game if he if he performs like he he can so you don't I mean, think the matchup is bad against paul Millsap? well no because i mean i think hibbert's just going to be able to he's tall he's taller than him so i think that's going to really help hibbert in the end because that's that's what hibbert relies on as being taller than everybody pretty sure much. the last three of the uh four games in the regular season i'm pretty sure that hibbert went scoreless yeah and i think that's just a fluke i think that's him having his own mental problems being upset probably not happy with how they're playing i mean they went nine and 13 in the last 24 games so mm-hmm. i'm sure he wasn't mentally in a good place for those games but i think now that it's playoff times i think he's going to be able to wrap his head back around it and so realize. you think he can get back to that 20 and 10 player that he, he was can. last year I, th- I think he can he just 
He just needs to take a deep breath, maybe count to three, mm-hmm. and go play against the Hawks, who I'm not writing them off. I mean, they did win the seven of the last ten. I'm not writing the Hawks off, but, I mean, I don't see them doing well against the Pacers, personally. If I think the big thing is that Roy Hibbert, I don't think we need to see him drop 20 and 10 in this series. I think that... This is a series where Paul George and Lance Stevenson and David West, I mean, this is a series where they need to shine, that they don't need Hibbert to be the offensive guy. Roy Hibbert should never be the Pacers' go-to option on offense, period. Unless you're playing the Heat, where it's just... I mean, it's known that Hibbert is going to get his numbers against the Heat. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anybody that is shocked by that at this point. But I don't know that he, you know, they found a a defensive stopper against Roy Hibbert sticking Udonis Haslam on him, it seems like. Haslam seems to fluster, but I mean, where in the past, every time they met him in the playoffs, Hibbert is still getting his. Even when he's flustered, he's still, his numbers are just dumb against the Heat. Him and David West, it's almost conceding that combined they're going to drop about 50 points Mm -hmm. and you just he play the pacer it's almost you have to make paul george or lance stevenson or one of those guys beat you yeah i think stevenson's going to be a big factor in this game because or in the series or yeah well in the series yeah i think i think he's but he's always kind of a factor you know if he gets hot-headed and gets kicked out of the game or you know um, and even against the heat like when he he left if he were there i think they would have won by a few more and they wouldn't have had to worry about it till the very end. I think that Lance Stevenson is the Pacers' most important player. You know, mm-hmm. he leaves the team in rebounding. He leaves leads the team in assists. He is that uh, offensive. Uh, well, what's the word? That, he's uh, a triple stuffer. double machine. Yeah, yeah he's a, he's a spark. Um, you know, he's he's the guy that gets them. The Pacers don't get a lot of fast break points. Mm-hmm. And frankly, for you know nine times out of ten when they do, it's because of Lance Stevenson. He's mm-hmm. an emotional guy. He sets the tone. That's the biggest thing. Is he can get he can turn the game with a monster stunk. He's the guy who draws that emotion out he can make a game-changing play i also think the pacers beating the thunder you know the last few games there i think that really helped them get their mentality back yeah that was a big win the thunder were trying to win that game for seeding it's mm-hmm. not like the thunder were resting players like that was a big legitimate win they i don't think we that. can write the pacers off they needed that the pacers like i said their their ceiling is they can win it all mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. uh so right here in the um for the pacers versus hawks your Point guard matchup is George Hill versus Jeff Teague. I would I don't think anyone can argue that Jeff Teague is a far superior, you know, point guard to mm-hmm. George Hill. Uh frankly, George Hill at this point is the liability for the Pacers mm-hmm. in their offense. Uh, you know, George Hill is not scoring. Jeff Teague is the better scoring point guard, but the thing about Jeff Teague is that he's going to have to initiate that half court offense against the Pacers every single time down the court. And I'm not sure that Jeff Teague is really that kind of point guard. I mean, he's great in the playoffs. He comes alive every single year but can he find the holes in the Pacers defense uh, and win a seven game series I don't I just don't think he can no I don't either no I don't think anyone I I mean I don't know I have the I have the Pacers winning the series in five games it's going to be some light work I think the Hawks might steal one but this isn't even this is even really there's a reason it's a 1-8 series all right and so uh, well what are your guys's uh, ceilings Uh, you already said ceiling is um, the finals for the Pacers you Justin? I, I I'm the exact same thing. I think Pacers are trying to do it all. It's gonna there's gonna be a lot of depending factors. They haven't left anyone with that feeling that they are confident in saying that they can do it. All yeah. right, how about the Hawks? Mm. Ceiling? They're not going past the Pacers. First round? Yeah. Yeah. Their ceiling was making the playoffs with all the injuries they had. That was a good thing for them. They should be excited about that, but I don't I mean, well, their GM said he wasn't sure that they wanted to make the playoffs, so are they excited about it? Well, well the I, GM might not be, but the players are, though. <laughs> the players should <laughs> yeah, be, at the least. They should be. And even the fans should be. Um, yeah. So moving forward, your next matchup is the Heat versus the Bobcats. Uh, the Heat won all four regular season meetings against and, the Bobcats by an average of 10.5 points. You know, and can LeBron have another 61-point yeah, game in this? <laughs> Will the Bobcats simply allow LeBron to score but try and shut down everybody else? You know, how did the Bobcats go moving forward to make this a competitive series and at least, you know, not end up getting swept? I mean, I think they just need to stick to their basics. They've been one of the best defensive teams in the league all year. I don't think there's any reason why you should make a drastic change to your scheme. LeBron is going to get his. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone doubts that. Could LeBron go off for 61 points? Of course he could. He's LeBron Mm -hmm. James. He could go off for 61 points on any given night. Mm -hmm. That's just the kind of player he is. But again, I think the Bobcats have been a a good defensive team. They need to get it to Al Jefferson in the post where he needs to set up shop and go to work. And Um, you know, that's Kimball Walker's job. So can Kimball Walker get the ball into Al Jefferson in the spots where Al Jefferson wants the ball? Jefferson just needs to exploit those matchups. The Heat have Bosch. The Heat have another. I mean, who's it going to be? Greg Oden, Udonis Haslam. That 
you know, Jefferson needs to become that post machine. And I think it will be. I mean, I've been singing his praises all season long. We all know <laughs> yes. my first uh, NBA defensive team that I had him as my starting center. So, you know, all about it. The point guard matchup in this one is Mario Chalmers versus Kimball Walker. And as everybody knows, both of those point guards are players who like to take the big shot. They live for the big moments. Yep. <laughs> right now, Mario Chalmers has a 67% effective field goal percentage on uncontested shots. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he will make the Bobcats pay if they try and double LeBron James or Dwayne Wade at any point because he's going to be left open. Yeah, Chalmers has range. I mean, it's been proven throughout all this. He's one of their he's one of their shooters. You give Mario Chalmers an open look, he's the type of guy that can make you pay. Mm-hmm. I agree. I think I think you just want to try to take advantage of when LeBron James comes out when he's not playing. Just try to play smart ball and pull ahead or or catch up depending on where you are at that point i think the biggest question for me this series is what do we see out of Dwayne wade i was just about to ask uh, do they because the heat don't exactly have to go into this and prove anything right. you know they can kind of coast through this right here and even if they you know give up a game or two it doesn't matter because they're obviously going to win uh, what does eric spolster do does he rest wade on a couple of these games to kind of save his energy for you know further down the road or did they play him i don't know if you rest him per se but limit i mean minutes. maybe limit his minutes if it's getting out you know, if they have a 3-0, 3-1 lead and they, you know, they're really in control of a game, you know, you don't want to have the worst thing that could happen is Dwayne Wade gets hurt against the Bobcats because that's a, I mean, that's the killer right there. Miami's not going to three people without Dwayne Wade. They need him. But I, and I don't think there's anyone who would pick the Bobcats to beat the Heat in this series. So the Heat need to focus on handling their business. They can ride LeBron's wave for this series, but mm-hmm. I, th- I don't think you want to rest Wade to the point where he's not playing. I think he needs to be ready to go now that it is playoff time and you know, ease his way into that. But I think if there's a chance to limit his minutes and you feel that it's needed and he's not 100%, yeah, you have to. I agree with that. Um, you don't want to, the worst thing that could happen would Wade get injured and then that's really going to hurt you when you get to the Pacers that could potentially be there. Absolutely. So uh, the Heat, we all have the Heat winning this. Um, How many games? I have them winning in five just because I feel like they're not going to take it as a threat and maybe give up one game here or there just because they don't feel like they need to prove anything. Okay. Yeah, I have five as well. I think there's there could be that home game where I think Charlotte mm-hmm. will steal one and Al Jefferson. It will be, it'll be like that feel good home game because yeah. Charlotte needs something. It's been it's been quite the basketball disaster there. They, well, this they is something. something they made the playoffs. Well, that's what I'm saying. They finally have something to cheer about. I think those fans are going to come out. Al Jefferson will have a big game. They're good enough defensively to fluster them a little bit. I, th- yeah. I think they'll steal one. All right. Well, I actually have Miami sweeping this. Okay. You know, I've been singing um, the Bobcats praises all season long, saying how great they were. But I just think that this is an unfair favorable matchup for them and i think that the heat take it in four so up next we have our three versus six matchup which is the raptors versus the nets they split the season series two and two but the raptors did end up in the end having a negative point differential of negative 2.5 points you know my biggest takeaway on the series is that the nets rank 27th in the nba in offensive rebounding whereas the raptors rank 11th are the Raptors for real? And is their system good enough to beat the veterans of the net? First off, before we even get into this, I just want to say that the Toronto faithful for this Raptors, they are getting ready for this. The ad campaign, this we are the North campaign, <laughs> they're trying to carve out an identity. They're really going for this. It seems like the city is behind this team more than I've ever seen a Raptors team, probably since Vince Carter. Oh, mm-hmm. they love it. Yeah, the Canadians love this Raptors team and they should. Yeah, I mean, what? I mean, I don't think anyone predicted that the Raptors want to finish the three seed in the East, especially after the Rudy Gay trade. It looked like they're ready to join, you know, Tankapalooza. Yeah, yeah. and they're—I mean—they're just playing really good basketball. They're—they're they're fundamentally sound. Uh, you know, they're running their offensive sets uh, defensively. You know, they're a really good team. They have a bunch of really good young players, and I mean, a, a lot of those players—they have—they have an all-star. You know, they have DeMar DeRozan. I honestly think the Raptors will beat the Nets. Really? I do. I think DeRozan and Ross, I think they're all just going to come. I I think they're going to do great. I think they're actually going to upset the Nets, and it's going to be devastating. Well, they wouldn't be upsetting the Nets. Well, I mean, not upsetting, but I think most people assume the Nets will win Mm -hmm. uh, just because of the, the veteran leadership on that team or all the veteran players on that team. I think I think the Raptors are going to beat them. I really do. I think Toronto is definitely the dark horse. I think the matchup that is most intriguing for me this series is is Kevin Garnett versus Jonas Valchunas. Um, you know, Valchunas has been a, a stud all season, a huge part mm-hmm. of this Toronto team, just an absolute animal, a double-double machine on the interior. Kevin Garnett 
hasn't really played this year. When he has, he's been very inefficient. Um, it seems like of all the Brooklyn elder statesmen, per se, we'll call them, he, it seems to be the one where age is catching up to him the fastest. Mm-hmm. He's been that defensive anchor. That's what they brought him in here to be. Can he do it come playoff time? I think he's going to try. I mean, it's not like Garnett to not show up to a playoff game. I think he's going to be, he'll do good, but I don't think he can do it for many games. Well, he's been resting about. at least. Yeah. Right? thing about the nets is that they actually have a lot of really favorable matchups mm-hmm. um, they're just a bigger team well that's what i was saying i was looking at kirilenko and what stuck out to me is he's averaging three steals per game which i thought was crazy well kirilenko is one of those players where what he does on the court doesn't necessarily show up in the stat sheet either i mean he's, he's great no. on defense yeah. he's a great passer he's just he's an all-around he's he's that glue guy that he, a lot of teams have he's, he's like a swiss PJ army Tucker. knife mm-hmm. he does everything well he mm-hmm. can give you a little bit of everything he's a force on defense he can get buckets he's a good passer he's he's a fundamental sound player i think the bench is going to be huge and the interesting thing for me is sean livingston has been inserted into that starting lineup mm-hmm. and they really have been playing well since they moved him into that starting lineup. and then they moved joe johnson down to the uh small forward right they're playing almost a they're playing a weird small balls pal pierce is uh playing the stretch four right now mm-hmm. it's just uh you know i'm curious to see what this match because it's almost as if they're embracing the fact that they're just <laughs> not a good offensive rebounding team like we said 27th in the league yeah, yeah i think they're just gonna get killed on well, the glass think, in this one do you think ross is gonna have trouble with uh, Joe Johnson I think a little bit I think that teams of if you if you watch Nets games I think you've seen teams kind of double Joe Johnson yeah. I don't think they want Joe Johnson to get into the paint at all which is interesting because he's he's been a great shooter mm-hmm. but it, it seems like well, they also either, post him up because he tends to have a favorable matchup when he's being posted up right you know, when, he's posting up against a, a shooting guard or a small forward that he's just he's got length on I mm-hmm. think what you'll see is I, I you know they'll have Ross on him to start and try to keep him in the perimeter but I wouldn't be surprised if you see a guy like Jonas Valkunas or Tyler Hansborough off the bench just kind of crash a little bit. If he even starts getting the paint a little bit, they'll take a step out and just try to make him beat him with the jump shot. They don't yeah. want him getting into the paint. Mm-hmm. And so the point guard matchup in this one is Kyle Lowry versus uh, Darren Williams. And the thing that's crazy about this is that if two years ago you were to say that Kyle Lowry was a superior point guard versus Darren Williams, everyone would have laughed at oh, you. Oh, yeah, I would say you're crazy. It, but now I, it's not even a debate. I mm-hmm. mean, it's just obvious who's a better point guard. He's had a, a far better year. Personally, Lowry is great at attacking with the pick and roll and knocking down open shots. And, you know, that allows him to play both on and off the ball. And I think in this series right here that Darren Williams needs to remind everybody you know why he's a star point guard and try and get Lowry try and trick Lowry into you know some early foul trouble they need Darren Williams Darren Williams just was not himself at all during the regular season he almost looked like he wasn't confident at times he needs to get back to being that elite point guard if they're really going to live up to their expectations Mm -hmm. can't can't just do it uh, with everybody else so the ceiling for the Raptors who do you guys think I don't see them making it past the second round so second round I think Miami won't won't have trouble with them either all right yeah they're the most intriguing because i think you don't really know what to expect out of them but just the fact that they're still still playoff newbies they're just i i don't really see them getting past the second round i think it's been written in stone all year that it's meant to be indiana miami in this eastern conference final mm-hmm. all right well i have their ceiling as a third round really? um yep and uh how about the nets what do you guys think that their ceiling is i could see them making it to the second round because i you know everyone that'd be a cool matchup the heat Nets going at it. Like I said, I have Toronto beating the Nets. I don't think they will uh, make it past the first. There's one weird scenario if you play the matchups where if they get by <laughs> Toronto and say, you know, we, they've been 4 0 against the Heat this year, yeah. say they're able to get by the Heat and they get to Indiana maybe they beat Indiana. There's that really, really long shot that with their veteran leadership and that Paul Mm -hmm. Pierce becomes that assassin in the fourth quarter and that maybe they sneak into the finals. But realistically, I probably have them going out in the second round. I just can't see them beating Miami in a seven game series. Right. I have their ceiling as the finals. I don't think that they could win a championship, but I do have their ceiling as the finals. So playoff prediction, uh, who wins the series and how many games? I have Toronto winning in seven. I have Brooklyn in seven. I I do think Toronto is going to give them fits a little bit. I think that crowd's going to be into it. The buzz is back for Toronto basketball, but Brooklyn's experience is just going to, it's just too much. I think that's going to be the difference maker. I got Nets and six. 
Mm-hmm. All right. All right. And then the last one in the Eastern Conference is the Chicago Bulls versus the Washington Wizards. The Wizards beat the Bulls two to one in the season series with the Bulls taking the last game. Of course, the Bulls defensive style makes any team not want to play them. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, with the Wizards being in the playoffs for the first time with this team, are they too young to outlast the Bulls and make it through a seven game series being frustrated by that uh, defense the whole time? I think so. I think they're going to be really I think the Wizards are going to be really pissed off every game. I think there's going to be a lot of tension between these two teams, even though, you know, I think John Wall is going to be pissed off. I think Bradley Beal is going to also be very annoyed because I think they're going to contest John Wall so much that he maybe will lose some confidence. I actually think this is going to be John Wall's coming out party. I mean, he's playing against DJ Augustine. I think that this is the time for him to shine. And, you know, this is really his first chance since being that, you know, number one overall pick that he's finally led the team to the playoffs. And this is just his time to shine. Well, hopefully he he can. I'm I'm worried that the defense of the Bulls are gonna uh, get get in his head, and maybe he he will uh, falter a little bit. The Bulls are good agitators. If there's anybody that's gonna get a young team off their game, it's the Bulls. Joe Kim Noah notorious for mm-hmm. getting into players' heads, and you know he'll be chirping the whole game. You know, yeah. just talking and talking and talking. You'll get Todd Gibson off the bench, huge potential sixth man of the year. Mm-hmm. Jimmy Butler making some strides, really good defensive player. I just think the Bulls experience is going to pay off here. I think the Bulls coaching with Thibodeau is going to pay off here. You know, they've been resilient all year with the dang trade with Derrick Rose going down when just when you thought they're going to pack it in. Joe Kim Noah is on a mission right now playing. He's not Kevin Durant, LeBron James, but you could put Joe Kim Noah potentially in that MVP conversation with just the season he's having. You know, he's become such a facilitator, which has been the most underrated development of his game this year, too. I mean, when have we seen a big man just facilitate the way he does this well, season? Mark Gasol. This year, though? I mean, oh, with, uh, yeah. I mean, Mark Gasol's assist much. numbers are up. I mean, he, yeah, he's missed plenty of games, but the, uh, the Grizzlies definitely run their offense through their center, similar to how the Bulls do. My question is, do you think Noah's going to have trouble with Gortat? Uh, no, I think that Noah's going to clean up Gortat. The thing about Gortat is that he's got a really good mid-range game, mm-hmm. but uh, Noah's just a much more explosive player. He just, he's a faster player. And I think Noah's going to be able to stop Gortat because Gortat has really terrible right. hands. He <laughs> simply just can't catch the ball. I think that Gortat maybe can give Noah a little bit of a, a defensive issues, but Noah's just going to clean. He's, he's going to shut down Gortat. This, this, this is where the Wizards, I think, are really going to miss an effective in a they need that veteran kind of guy. Well, the guy can gonna do be the, effective? I mean, I think he can. I think he could potentially, but I mean, it hasn't been there all year. That could be the wild card for me. But this is when, you know, if, if we knew we had 100% guaranteed healthy Nene, he could bang in the paint. He's got that veteran stable presence. You know, they yeah. need him. Well, do you think it, I would assume that, well, maybe they would put Boozer on Nene. Do you think? That would uh, maybe throw him off. Yeah, since he's not completely healthy, do you think if he's in there, do you, that's that might gonna, actually help him out? You think? Yeah, I mean, Boozer's a terrible defender. You put a terrible defender on Nene, let him get a little confidence up, and bam, all of a sudden you have your sharp Boozer's player. Boozer's got a score for the Bulls, too. That's the other thing. If we're going to talk about Boozer, Boozer's got a score for yeah. them. You know, I, I think we all think he's going to get amnesty next year and we'll be mm-hmm. out the door, but they're going to advance and, you know, really make a run at this and, you know, maybe try to be a dark horse Eastern Conference Finals team. They need big time <clears throat> contributions out of boozer it can't all be on noah i agree so the point guard matchup in this is uh dj augustine versus john wall <laughs> i think dj augustine he's shooting 41 percent from three and destroying teams with a pick and roll i don't know where he came from this year i don't know why he's good this year when he was so terrible last year but <laughs> it is what it is mm-hmm. i think for more for wall it's more about how he attacks the entire bulls defense than an individual matchup he's actually fared pretty well against the bulls in the regular season he shot 50 percent and averaged 21 points and i think that if he can get past Noah or Gibson hedging and he can make his way to the rim you know he'll be successful or if he does make his way to the rim after he gets by that hedge he can kick it out to that open shooter yeah you know hit hit Martel Webster on the corner or well Bradley Beal what's uh the deal with him is he might have some interesting uh games right oh yeah well I mean what they're gonna put um uh, Jimmy Butler on him so yeah. you know that might shut him down a little bit yeah that'll be an interesting matchup to see but there. this definitely could be a coming out party for Bradley Beal as well yeah, definitely. Like we've been talking about, the Wizards have one of the most dynamic young backcourts in the league. Mm-hmm. The mission at the beginning of the season for them, and we saw it on John Wall's shoes every night, was playoffs. Now it's, are they going to take that second step, or is this maybe this is the first year and the beginning of something great? Who knows? Well, uh, actually, why don't I just ask you guys? Who wins the series and how many games? I have the Bulls in six. I think the coaching is there. I think the grit is there. I think the experience is there. You know, I do think John Wall is going to be great this series, but I don't think they have enough firepower to get by the Bulls. 
I actually have uh, Chicago in seven. Oh, I think okay. it'll take it take them a while, but I think they'll beat them. I got Wizards in seven. Oh, okay. I think the Wizards are going to take this one. The Bulls have the lowest effective field goal percentage in okay. the NBA, and I don't think when you're the worst shooting team in the NBA <laughs> that you can take a series. Quite well, frankly, it'll definitely be an interesting one. There, there's going to be some frustrated people in that series for uh, sure. Ceiling for the Bulls. I don't see them getting past the Pacers. I think they'll piss off the Pacers a lot, but maybe, maybe third round. At most, I would give them. Okay, so third round, conference finals. How about you, Kevin? I think they'll piss off enough teams to get to that second round, and I think they'll. I don't think anybody necessarily wants to play them per se. But are they going to beat Miami or Indiana seven game series? No, I don't think that. All right, I got I got second round also for my ceiling for the Bulls. How about the Wizards? What are the Wizards' uh, ceiling? Second round, if they get past the Bulls, I don't see them getting any farther. If they get hot second round, but I think they've probably already reached their ceiling by getting into the playoffs. Mm-hmm. All right, I got I got them going out. I think second round's also their ceiling. Okay. So moving forward, why don't we go ahead and get right into grind my gears? Okay. What grinds my gears? All right, today on Grind My Gears, my topic is about people who do not re-rack the weights in the right way at the gym. I mean, come on. You're in the gym because you're trying to lose weight and you're trying to not be lazy. And that is the biggest form of laziness that you can do in the gym, pretty much. It's not the people that works there's job. Their job is to make sure you stay safe and keep the place clean. Not to re-rack your weights because you did too much or you didn't feel the need to take it back to its rightful spot. When you're in the gym, you're trying to lose weight. So it's almost like you're skipping out on part of your workout. When you don't do that it makes everyone else have to work harder and that's fine it's just pure laziness if you don't take the time to put the weights back then you're pretty much skipping out on half of your workout and to not to mention when you put a 25 pound weight where the 45 pound weight's supposed to go now you're making me have to take off the 25 put it on the ground pick up the 45 put it where i want to go and then put the 25 back in its rightful spot where if you had just done it it wouldn't have caused a big problem and no one would be upset if you're gonna go to the gym don't be lazy be completely about the workout and part of the workout is putting the weights back carrying that 50 pound weight back to its spot is still part of a workout that's a lot of work on your body to carry it back so instead of just doing half a workout and not putting any of the weights back and making everybody else do the work for you why don't you put the weights back or put them in the right spot when you don't put the weights back you could potentially hurt someone because say i want to use a 35 pound weight and you put a 50 pound there and i pick it up expecting it to only be 35 pounds i could throw up my back or worse, fall over and hit my face. Everyone's trying to go there to be healthier, not to get hurt again. So why don't you just put the weights back in the rifle spot, finish your workout, and go home. Do it for America, people. So we're kind of pressed for time here. So, you know, we went a little bit long. But, Justin, why don't you tell us about any other news that's going around in the NBA League right now? Okay. I got a good story right here. Uh, Close to my heart, too. It's Michael Carter-Williams of the 76ers was voted Rookie of the Month for April, and he was voted Rookie of the Month for the fourth time this season. Yes. All right. He's in some pretty elite company. Over the past 10 years, there's been seven other players who have won the Rookie of the Month four times. Mm -hmm. Damian Lillard, John Wall, Blake Griffin, Brandon Jennings, Kevin Durant, Chris Paul, and Emeka Okafor. Some great A company. Yeah. Uh, Brandon Jennings. I mean, Brandon Jennings is on the lower tier of that list, but Kevin Durant, Chris Paul, Blake Griffin, your boy John Wall, who you say is going to have a breakout game. That's oh, I mean, I love John Wall's game. I, I've been into John Wall for a couple of years now. I'm just waiting for him to explode, but I still think you don't want to be grouped at all with Brandon Jennings. Well, just taking a look at this list, five of those players went on to win Rookie of the Year. John Wall did not. He lost out to Blake Griffin, so it was two in the same year, kind of one of those, you know, mm-hmm. just a great rookie year. The other was Brandon Jennings. He didn't win Rookie of the Year. He actually lost out to Tyreek Evans that uh, year. I mean, it's for Rookie of the Year, it's a runaway at this point. Michael Carter-Williams averaging 17.6 points, 7.5 rebounds, 6.4 assists per game. He's only averaging about two turnovers a night, and he's got a true shooting percentage of 59.3% pretty bad during that losing streak especially yeah. towards beating that losing streak but he's still leading every rookie in statistical categories i mean the only one that's even close is oladipo to me yeah i mean gorgie dang since rick adelman has been playing him has actually been a phenomenal phenomenal player um he, but apart from that do you think if he played more of the season he would have uh, contended yeah for you rookie think? of the year absolutely i mean okay. he's just he's been a beast ever since he got yeah. playing time unfortunately he was playing in minnesota and we'll talk about the timberwolves a little bit coming up but rick adelman's never been the type of clo- coach that really believes in uh, developing 
developing developing young talent. Uh, you can look and see what they did with basically every draft pick they've had right. since he's been the coach, and it's too bad because Gorgie Dang has just been phenomenal. Another yeah. tidbit, if Carter Williams does end up winning the Rookie of the Year, he'll be the only other Sixer to win since Allen Iverson in 1997. Mm-hmm. So again, some pretty good company to be in. It is. Uh, he doesn't have a whole lot of competition this year, but yeah. you know, it's, it's been a historically bad rookie class yeah you know, he's, I, he's the best of the worst yeah he's definitely well he's, he stood himself out i mean i think he's really uh you know he's been a standout player i agree that the class as a whole is definitely down um i think there's you know two three four guys you can take away from this class that you are you know they could even be role with. players yeah. no stars there wasn't a single star in this class i That's think carter right. williams could be a star i think Over he could Depot. be a starting point guard you gotta understand yeah but you gotta understand he's putting up these numbers now he's averaging almost 18 points and six assists with one of the worst teams of all time surrounded by him and what's the shooting percentage his true shooting percentage is 59.3 his, his actual shooting percentage is not great but you also gotta remember he's not gonna be taking nearly that many shots when he's not the only realistic option on the floor well for you guys sake i i hope that that's the case <laughs> uh what do we have next the NBA bottom five have been picked, and the odds are in. Uh, they have Milwaukee going number one, Philly number two, Orlando three, Utah number four, and Boston number five. Yeah, and I think the Lakers were slated for number six. So okay. you guys being a couple of Philadelphia 76ers fan, if you do get that number two pick, who do you think that the 76ers should take? I think we're going to take either Parker or Wiggins, yeah, whoever's I think, there. Yeah, Parker or Wiggins are the two big prizes. I think, you know, they, I think Wiggins is going to be their go-to guy of who they want. He, there's a very good chance he may not be there after number one so I, I think Wiggins and Parker are the two clear prizes mm-hmm. of this draft so whoever didn't get picked is is who the 76ers exactly. are going to take yeah, I, definitely. I, 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 so. I don't think they take MB because I think they have Merlin's Noel it'd be kind of a it'd be an interesting way to fit MB into that lineup and I just don't think Exum is as good as the first two yeah okay. All right, so uh, what's next? Okay, the uh, Phoenix Suns forward, Channing Fry has stated that he hopes to work out a contract extension with the uh, Suns this summer. He has the option to opt out. Uh, he's currently making $6.5 million a year. This upcoming week, we have a midweek episode with our Phoenix Suns analyst, Ryan Lehmeyer. Cool. Uh, I think it's a, a great option for Fry. I really hope that the Suns keep him. He's, mm-hmm. you know, he's, he's an Arizona native. He could very well retire a son. I think if the Suns were to give him around 4 or $5 million, that there's no harm in that, mm-hmm. uh, even if he shouldn't be necessarily starting next year, why not bring him in off the bench? Um, you know, uh, he's a fan favorite. Everybody really loves him. Keep him with the organization. And he's still a good shooter. That's the thing. You know, you can have that longevity if all he has to do is come off the bench and shoot threes. Mm -hmm. Yep, and he can post up a little bit. So, All right, well, it'll be interesting to see what happens. The NBA salary cap is expected to increase by nearly 8% next season, which actually is a big thing because that gives the more viable option for the Bulls. They might be able to get Carmelo. Yeah, I found this a really interesting story, and we didn't really have time to talk about it earlier today, but NBA salary cap going up next year, that opens up a lot of room for some of these other teams to take on Carmelo Anthony. I hate the salary cap. Cap. I'm just going to put that out there. I think the salary cap is really dumb. They either need to, I, you know, we talk about tanking and we talk about ways to fix tanking. You know what? Either set a hard cap where you can't go over it and you can't have teams paying absurdly big luxury taxes like Brooklyn or maybe even Miami, or you just totally get rid of it like baseball does. And if somebody wants to throw LeBron James $400 million and then handicap themselves, you know, that's on them. I agree with the salary cap. I think that if you don't have a salary cap, it makes it too hard for some of those mid-level and smaller market teams to, you know, ever really compete. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a good thing that's there. It could be raised a little bit, though. I, I kind of, you know, I'm all about this move. I think it'll be interesting if Carmelo goes over to the Bulls. I don't want to see him on the next next year. I'm tired, frankly, of just talking about it. <laughs> and uh, so I, I hope that, you know, this does open up the door for some of those other teams and we get to see some fun trades this summer. The one thing It'll I will say is... When Melo left the Nuggets to go to the Knicks, they essentially destroyed the Knicks team for for them to get him, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And they've never been able to rebuild around him since I then. don't think that if he goes to Chicago, if I'm Carmelo Anthony, I wouldn't want to have another situation like that. You don't want to have it where there has to be that rebuild again. I think you want to go wherever you can fit in. And where it's already a complete team where you're not going to totally it doesn't need to be a situation where the Bulls would have to give up like a Todd Gibson, and a Jimmy mm-hmm. Butler to get Carmelo Anthony as great as Carmelo Anthony is. At what point do you need the depth then too? I think the Carmelo had a Knicks statement problem. around that also. He said that he just he's at this point in his career where he doesn't want to rebuild. Right. He's not he a just rebuilding. wants to win. Yes. I mean, he is getting up there in age. Mm-hmm. So it's something to be worried about. So <laughs> I got a news story that uh, smells a little funny here. 
Blake Griffin said in an interview with Rolling Stones that medical marijuana makes sense to him. He stated that if pot was legal, all, a lot of athletes wouldn't have to take so many pain pills. We were talking a few weeks ago about how Larry Sanders, you know, could possibly be the spokesperson mm -hmm. uh, for medical pot in the NBA. And I actually, the thing that I took away from this is that those NBA players, they are getting injured a lot. And would you rather have NBA players that are all hopped up on all these prescription drug pills or would you rather have a few of them smoking pot and so they don't have to be messed up on, you know, oxycontins and stuff all the time. I think mm -hmm. that he made a really valid point. Yeah, if it's for if it's for medical reasons and you get medical clearance from a doctor, why would you not? If it's a genuine solution to your problem, why would you not have that option on the table? It, it just doesn't. If make it's sense. legal, why can't it be legal in the NBA? Exactly. I think it's going to be a tough one to sell to pretty much anybody at this point because it's hard to sell it just for normal people. You know, give not, it time. Not, yeah. Give it time. Wait for uh, the social structures to kind of change a little bit. Exactly. And, I think it'll happen, just it'll take some time. Mm -hmm. uh, the Milwaukee Bucks owner, Herb Cole, announced <clears throat> Wednesday that the team would be sold for about $550 million to a group led by hedge fund titans Wesley Eddins and Mark Lazary. I mean, that just shows you how much money there is in the NBA when the Milwaukee Bucks sold for uh, half a billion dollars. That's a lot of money. I wish I had that much money. Well, the mo and most importantly, too, is the pledge that they're going to build a new arena. You know, the big fear was that Milwaukee was going to leave. And, you know, if there's a new arena in place, the Bucks get to stay. Yep, absolutely. And as bad as they were, I think they quietly, for as much attention was paid at the Sixers and, you know, the Celtics struggles because they're a bigger franchise, the Bucks still were the worst team in the league this year. And I feel like no one is talking about that fact. Well, the reason why they weren't talking about it so much is because the, the Sixers were intentionally trying to be bad, whereas the Bucks weren't trying to be bad. So a lot of focus was given to tanking. And how good is that? for the sport when you have teams that are intentionally trying to lose, where the Bucks, you just had a team that was incompetent. I mean, they were trying to be good, and they weren't. The future could be bright in Milwaukee. Giannis is there. The Greek freak could have the number one pick this year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Yep, it's possible. Might be turning things around a little bit. Rick Adelman, uh, it's expected to be his last year. They think he will opt out of his contract with the Wolves this summer. Oh, I'm so happy about this. I cannot stand rick ottoman i hate the way that they don't develop their players i just don't think that he's a very good coach um i can't trust this enough i cannot stand the fact that he has ruined every single draft pick that the wolves have gotten since he became the coach of the timberwolves i cannot wait to see him out of that coaching position minnesota we i mean we rip on new york all the time but minnesota is a fire sale too i mean that's just absolutely just a horrible situation especially with kevin love potentially going out the door they haven't made the playoffs since he's been there no they, they were just, they were over 500 this year like they they have gotten a better team and everything but imagine how much better they'd be if they would have taken had a competent look. drafting yeah well not competent it's not that they drafted bad it's that they don't they, they drafted bad no okay so gorgie dang didn't get any playing time this year until uh nikolai pekovic went out and then one once he got some playing time, he's averaging 15 points and like 12 rebounds. Yeah, they also drafted Johnny Flynn and Ricky Rubio back to back. Why would you draft two straight point guards? Oh, right. No, I get that. But since Adelman's been in, I'm talking about the drafting since Adelman's been in. I think that they've ruined every draft pick. And well, you and I were having this discussion off the air the other day about Derek Williams. And you can say whatever you want about Derek Williams. But I think that the Minnesota Timberwolves stunted its growth. I mean, they didn't give him any playing time. They just they didn't develop him off the court at all. And look where he is now. And I just I'm so I can't I can't wait till rick adelman's gone i'm <laughs> so excited okay not jo my favorite coach no i no. can i can i can tell uh joe dumars of the detroit pistons stepped down this week as head head of basketball operations he will take an advisory role with the pistons moving forward I mean, he's been a legend in detroit as a player with the bad boys and then mm -hmm. you know he was the gm during that dominant run of eastern conference play you know culminating in the title the one year but he's just made some boneheaded decisions over the past few years well, that was all of the notes. Okay. Thank you, everybody, so much for listening to this week's Drive and Dish podcast. We know we went a little bit longer than normal, but we had so much to cover with the first round of the NBA playoffs finally mm -hmm. here. And it was a special playoff edition anyway. We said that in the introduction. Exactly. So. And I'm sure that the title of the episode says something about it too. So you <laughs> had to know before you hit the little button. Either you way. 
you got yourselves into this. <laughs> yeah, so thank you for listening all the way to the end. Remember that you can hit us up anytime you want on Twitter by hashtagging D-A-D-Pod. That's hashtag dad pod. Uh, we're also on Facebook now, facebook.com slash drive and dish podcast. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast yet on iTunes, make sure you go over to iTunes and search drive and dish. Also, please leave us a review. Leave a rating, four or five stars. We really appreciate it. It helps us move up the ladder right there. And if you hit that subscribe button, you'll instantly get the episodes downloaded to your phone, to your iPad, to your computer, you know, wherever you may be listening to us. So it will be fresh and it'll be up to date. You can hear some of the midweek episodes we have coming. Like Tim said, we have one about the Phoenix Suns coming later this week. And, you know, we're going to be more active on social media. Follow us on Twitter. I'm at refuse to lose. Like I said, R-A-F-U-S-E to lose. You have Tim at Tim from Tucson, Justin at Radio Justin 904. You know, we're going to be active on Twitter. You can hashtag DAD pod. Like Tim said, you can talk to us about the games and all the latest action. And we'll be posting content to our Facebook page, all the latest news, updates, scores, everything your NBA fanhood could desire. Yeah, I don't even work. I just stare at my Twitter all day. So Exactly. Justin is going to be staring at his Twitter. <laughs> so tweet him. He will respond. Or maybe he'll just stare at it. I don't. I don't know. It depends that, on the comment. That's to be determined. So happy round one. The day is here. Next week, we'll have some, uh, hopefully see whether these, some of these series are decided or, uh, you know, getting close to that level yet. That's all. That's all. Thank you for listening to the Drive and Dish NBA podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes by searching Drive and Dish. On Twitter, use the hashtag DADpod. You can find Kevin at Refuse to Lose, Justin at Jay Kuzark, and Tim at Tim from Tucson. We would like to thank Cox Media Group for allowing us to use their studio here in Jacksonville. We are in no way affiliated with the NBA, and any sound clips you heard on today's episode are copyright of their respective copyright owners. Go get them. We'll talk to you later. Until next time. Toodaloo. Yeah. Yeah.